Porsche has redesigned the 911. Did they get it right? We'll find out this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be. You know, 1998 will definitely go down as the year of the Volkswagen Beetle. What's that got to do with the Porsche 911, you ask? Well, plenty. When you consider the original inspiration for the 911 came from the Beetle. First, there was a 356, and in 1964, the very first 911. Well, this year, 34 years later, Porsche has come out with its very first completely brand new redesign from the ground up 911. Now, many people felt there was nothing wrong with the old one. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, has this Porsche once again raised the benchmark in the world of sports cars? We hope to find out this week on Motoring 98. The previous 911 was a car that everyone loved and they didn't necessarily realize that it was broke. <laughs> but I think once you drive the new car, you realize that uh, there, were, uh, there was progress to be made. Uh, the Porsche engineers are very goal oriented. They sat down and looked long and hard at the previous 911 to determine what could be improved. And that went from making the car more user friendly to making it easier to uh, drive and easier to own from a, uh, a maintenance standpoint. The drivetrain is completely new. While we still have a flat six cylinder engine in the back of the car, previously it was air cooled. Now it's a water cooled engine. It's actually slightly smaller, but it makes about 6% more horsepower. And it's water cooled, which is a big departure for 911s. Now we've kept the traditional 911 shape, the hood line, the fender line, uh, the, uh, the shape of the glass but all the parts are completely new. There's no carryover. Historically, 911s have been unique vehicles that didn't share parts with any of the other Porsche line. But this new 911 has about 30% of its parts in common with the Boxster. The two cars were developed simultaneously and they determined that a certain number of parts did need to be shared to uh, have some cost containment and make the car economical to develop. Some of the things that you'll see is the front fenders, the hood, um, and some of the sheet metal that you can't see underneath. But in doing so, has Porsche compromised the integrity of the 911? Is it just a more expensive Boxster? I, I don't think so. I think, I think they're still two very distinct automobiles and, and Porsche has to rationalize like, like every other automobile maker does, perhaps more so because they're so small uh, and you know, basically a two-line uh, company. Well, really what you'll find is the 911 and the Boxster, even though they have 30% of their parts in common, they do have, at first glance, a lot in common and look similar in ways. You find the character of the cars are very different. The 911 was designed to continue with the 911 feel, the 911 soul, but to improve every performance aspect of the previous 911. The old Porsches were uh, tricky to drive, you know, at the limit or, or when you were driving them hard. This one is just so well balanced and, and has basically all the, all the mean and nastiness we find right out of it, you know. Well, the, don't forget that the market uh, that Porsche is about, uh, is after, sorry, uh, 45 years old or something, um, is getting treated very, very well by other manufacturers in their sedan cars. So when people are getting into a sports car, they still want to have some commodities, uh, some comfort. And with this uh, new 911, uh, Porsche is delivering these commodities and these comforts that their market wants. But they're not compromising. At the racetrack, Bob English has a choice between the new 911 and the old one. Which one does he hop into? 
Um, I'd have to have the old one. Uh, on the track, it's 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 more fun. It it makes all the right noises. Uh, uh, turning is sharper. Uh, the, the buyer uh, who uh, the, the Porsche 911 buyer isn't likely to be out on a racetrack too often in his uh, in his ownership of the car, and he wants a car that he can hop into and tour the country from coast to coast in comfort, which you can with this car. The old car would be would test your enthusiasm in that regard. I'm, I'm sure the engineers in Weissach are definitely looking at, at what's in the future. Uh, to uh, quote uh, Dr. Porsche when he was asked once what his favorite Porsche is, he said it's the next one because they're always going forward. They're always developing and improving. And you'll, uh, well, I personally don't really know what's in the future, but we know it will outperform what we have today. There is an inherent advantage of sitting in the middle of the vehicle. Simply stated, it allows you to wear your best 10 gallon hat and still have headroom to spare. tried and true gawk meter has been off the scale since picking up our test vehicle. This is of course the all new Volkswagen Beetle. Now nothing, not a Hummer nor a Ferrari has come close to getting the looks and stares that this vehicle alone has got. Now, that makes it a winner when it comes to appearance. However, on test drive we go well beyond the sheet metal. The Beetle's basic platform and structure is essentially a straight lift from the new Golf, and I stress the new one and not the one that we drive around at the moment. Likewise for the suspension. Up front a McPherson struts and a sway bar, while the rear uses a V-shaped twist beam rear axle. In the pylon test, the Beetle fared far better than I expected it to. Yes, it still wags the inside rear wheel as you near the limit, and yes, understeer is a factor. However, given its station in life, the Beetle is more than competent and quite capable of doing what the average owner will ask. Stopping power comes from vented front rotors, solid rear rotors and full anti-lock. Drop the anchor and it'll take you about 110 feet to stop from 80k. The pedal feel is all it should be and the ABS keeps its nose out of the day-to-day -day operation. The problem lies in the fact that the anti-lock system is optional. VW should take a page out of GM's book and make this important safety feature standard. On the original Beetle, you'd have found the engine in the back. On the new one, what you find is a full-size spare tire, the jack and tools, and a six-pack CD player. The one thing you won't find is space. The other place you won't find it, of course, is the back seat. However, fold the seat down and view that now as an extension of the trunk, and you do have some usable space. Inside the Beetle, you've got a very nice set of instrumentation, a radio that sits above the climate controls, and a set of secondary controls that fall very readily to hand. You even get three coffee cup holders up front. Why, I'm not quite sure. The other thing you get in a vain attempt to make this vehicle look like the original, grab handles on the B pillars, and of course, that unique bud vase. You know, the single biggest drawback with this Beetle is its outward visibility, and it's for two very different reasons. First of all, all of the pillars are so chunky that they inhibit your view forward, to the side, and to the rear. The second problem, because the driver sits almost in the middle of the vehicle and because of the size of the dash, now if this were real estate in downtown Tokyo, it would be worth a small fortune, you cannot see anything ahead of the front wiper blades. As a result, well, all of this goes unseen. Power comes from a single overhead cam 16 valve 4 that's good for 115 horsepower at 5200 RPM and 122 pounds feet of torque at a respectable 2600 RPM. While the numbers are not outstanding, the performance, particularly in the lowered mid ranges, is good. There's an old saying, you know you're in trouble when. Well, the when hits you with this beetle as you go to get onto the highway. At 60 kilometers an hour, you're pulling about 2000 RPM. At 100K, you pull it up to about 3000 RPM. And if you keep up to traffic, you can have the engine churning away at almost 4000 RPM. Now, let me tell you, that on a long trip is going to be more than monotonous. 
transmission itself is user-friendly, offering short throws, a crisp gait and a progressive clutch. Indeed, it is the combined attributes of the engine and gearbox that make this car as much fun as it is to drive around town. You know, aside from the bud vase and the overall look, this Beetle has got absolutely nothing in common with the original. In short, if you're looking to reminisce about the good old days whilst behind the wheel of this car, you're barking up the wrong tree. And you should also remember, the cost of being cute is not cheap. Well, we've spent six months and 12,000 kilometers with our long-term Toyota Corolla, and this week it is time to offer the bottom line as we wrap things up. In a time when consumers have been brainwashed to believe bigger is better, along comes the all-new Corolla. It sits under the small sedan category, but it drives like a more expensive mid-sized vehicle. The name Camry comes to mind. This car is larger and more powerful than the one it replaces. The all-new and lighter 1.8 liter is the only engine offered, and it's more than enough with plenty of torque when you need it. At highway speeds, it couldn't get any smoother, and wind noise is almost nil. Inside, the fit and finish is what you would expect from Toyota, but usually further up the company's food chain. As for its rivals, well, with the exception of the Honda Civic SE, the competition is really a lot more expensive. Now usually we can find a pet peeve, but it wasn't easy with the Corolla, although Graham said he'd like to see some better rubber. He found he couldn't get off the line sometimes without a little wheel spin, and you'd also be advised to get a good line on some winter tires, but other than that, there's only one pet peeve that he and I could both agree on, and that is, we have to take it back to Toyota. Alright, let's now check out those important numbers. Our Midas tip of the week concerns radiator airflow restrictions. No matter how good your rad water pump belts and hoses are, you could have completely full clean coolant and still not have complete engine cooling if you've got a restricted radiator. On today's vehicles, inspecting the front of the rad isn't always an easy task. It's something that you might want to have done professionally because sometimes you have to separate the rad and condenser somewhat in order to see down between them. And what you see may surprise you. On quite new vehicles, you'll quite often find there's a significant restriction in the front of the rad. Now this vehicle has only 9,000 kilometers on it, it's a 1998, and you can already see quite a bit of dandelion seed in the front of the rad. By no means enough to cause an overheating situation at this stage of the game. But if it's left to build up over the years, other debris will mat in there and eventually clog the radiator. So at least once a year, get the front of that radiator inspected and cleaned as necessary. And don't overdo it when you're cleaning it. Don't use excessive pressure from a water hose or compressed air. You want to go very gently from the back of the rad in order to flush that stuff out. Or in some cases, you can use a shop vac with a crevice tool and vacuum the debris off the front. In any case, check it out just before the onset of the hot weather or before you make a trip to the southern states in the middle of the winter because it could cause you an overheated engine. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. Well, it's a pretty unusual car. Apparently it's the oldest in-service running car in Canada. It's a 1960 vintage Saab. It's a, a three-cylinder, two-stroke, uh, front-wheel drive, very famous for rallying in the 60s, usually driven by a very famous rally driver called Eric Carlson. Mr. Carlson is still considered to be a roving ambassador for Saab cars worldwide, and he very kindly signed the owner's books for me on this car, so that's probably added some value to the car as well. This particular model was never imported into Canada, and they were imported into, into the States in limited numbers, but I've been told that this is one of six in North America in this condition, in running condition, and uh, as far as I know, it's the only one running in Canada, so it's kind of nice to have a, a one-off here uh, in Toronto.
You know, there's only one thing stopping you from thoroughly enjoying a Porsche 911. That goes back to the early 60s. It's called a speed limit, and there aren't men and women paid to keep the speed limit. In this case, it's Officer Hees of the Washington State Patrol. He has pulled me over. Yes, I'm embarrassed and embarrassed about the speed limit. There is some good news, though, but I'll wait till the end of the program to tell you that. Right now, let's go to a man who I know will be grinning from ear to ear, and that, of course, is Bill Gardner. Brad, you're not just kidding. Folks, here's the numbers that Brad was either afraid or ashamed to tell you. 62 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone, in a Porsche. Brad, if I were you, I'd be ashamed of myself for not going faster. I'd embellish the story to read something like 162 if I were you, just to save face. Well, the good news is that Brad got off, and uh, I guess if it had been 162, A, we'd need a new host, and B, Brad would be doing his first story on the production of license plates. Anyhow, uh, what I want to talk about this week on my segment is the outsourcing of components on today's vehicles. There's nothing new about it, it's been going on for years. And in the pickup truck segment, I find it really ironic because when you pick up the magazines and newspapers and you read the ads of the big three, Ford, GM and Chrysler, they're beating each other up about how much better their truck is than the other guys. But when you get underneath the skin, open the hood and pull the wheels off the thing, you'd be amazed how many components they're buying from each other. Let's go have a look at one example. Here we are in the engine bay of the 98 Ram pickup truck. This is their 5.2 liter Chrysler engine, their own in-house engine, been around forever and a day. It's a great engine, a good runner, really strong, lots of power, uh, good torque, good drivability and reasonable fuel economy and this thing's bulletproof. When you look at the accessories, you'll find that they've outsourced a lot of the accessories and believe me, they've gone to the right guys. Now uh, the alternator is a Denso unit, it's made in Tennessee but you can sure see a lot of similarity to the Nippon Denso alternators that we see in a lot of the Japanese vehicles. And believe me, that's a good unit, an excellent alternator. Back in this corner of the hood, we find a Kelsey Hayes anti-lock brake unit. And Kelsey Hayes manufactures brake components for a lot of vehicle manufacturers. There's the Kelsey Hayes proportioning valve for the brakes. And over here, the Bosch vacuum assisted power brake booster. Moving down onto the engine, Boy, oh boy, that power steering uh, pump sure looks a whole lot like the Saginaw unit that General Motors produces. That's an excellent power steering pump, pretty near indestructible, and believe me, they picked the right supplier there. Okay, I've jacked the truck up and removed the rear wheels. You can have a look at the drum brake system on the rear, and we've got a mixture of components here from different manufacturers. A Bosch brake drum, you can see they've stamped the maximum diameter in here, and the drum itself is a real beefy, husky unit. This area where the drum slides over the wheel studs is exceptionally thick, the drum itself is quite hefty and that uh, bodes well for long-term performance of your brake system. Means that that drum is likely not to distort under severe usage. Now inside the drum we can see all the uh, brake shoes and hardware here. Uh, Delco Marine wheel cylinder and Delco Marine brake shoes and hold down hardware and return springs. And uh, if you look over here closely on the leading edge of this shoe, you can see that uh, the, the word Delco is printed right on there. And that's uh, the Delco Marine division of General Motors. Excellent quality brake components. That wheel cylinder, for example, is probably the best in the industry. We've moved up to the left front wheel, pulled the wheel off, and I've also backed out the two caliper high tensile bolts so I can lift the complete caliper and pad assembly off. And believe me, if you've ever done a brake job on a GM pickup, you're going to feel right at home because there's a Delco Marine caliper and pads exactly the same as you'd find on a GM truck. Now, here again, this is world-class quality stuff. The sliders are excellent on these calipers. They're always free, well lubricated in the inside of this bore and protected at both ends. The hydraulic portion of this caliper, the uh, piston, dust boot and seal are excellent as well. This is probably the most durable caliper in the business. And the pads are very easy to change and reasonably durable as well. They picked the right hardware here. It sure comes on and off in a hurry and it's easy and durable, easy to work with. I'll tell you, of all those parts that I just showed you that they're having built by somebody else, they're the best of the best, believe me. The Delco brakes on the back, the brake shoes and wheel cylinders, the calipers and pads on the front. We've worked with them for many years on other vehicles and they're as good as it gets. And there's no reason, I guess, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. In any case, there's just one thing that I'd like to be able to figure out, why the brakes on my GM pickup with all Delco brake parts don't work as well as the Delco brakes on this Dodge Ram pickup. Doesn't make any sense to me. Anyhow, till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 98. Want to reduce the sticker shock on your next new car purchase? Have I got a deal for you. That's coming up next on Kenzie's Corner.
let me see if I've got the concept of logo branded apparel figured out. It looks like Tommy or Ralph or Nike charges you extra to wear a sweatshirt because of the advertising on it. Then they use the money they make to pay Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky or somebody millions of dollars to wear the shirt for free that you're paying extra for. Is that pretty much it? Sorry guys, I'm not going to play that game. What about this one? Well, Brad gives me these shirts. But you know, somebody in the logo branded apparel business must have worked at a car dealership because dealerships have been doing this for years. The last thing that happens to your car is it rolls out the showroom floor, they slap an ad for the dealership on the back. Now, if they put that ad on a bus shelter or a magazine or a TV show, they'd pay for that. But they're expecting you, who's paying 30, 40, 50, 200,000 dollars for the car, to advertise the dealership for free. Nice work if you can get it. You know, it used to be worse. They used to drill holes in the back of the car and bolt the sign on there. And of course, that's where the rust would start. Well, maybe that was a little vertical integration to give the body shop some business. But you know, you don't have to take that sign. You don't have to have that thing on the back of your car. You can tell them you don't want it. Or maybe you can make a deal. Yeah, I can see it all now. I'm just ready to sign for my brand new car. And then I say to the sales rep, wait a minute, I want $2,000 to advertise your dealership. He's going to go crazy. He says, I can't do that. Maybe I can give you a hundred bucks. I'm going to say to him, well, let me take that back to my manager, see if you'll sign it off. I'm Jim Kenzie. As a guy who's had a passion for 9-11 since I can remember, I have to admit to suffering just a few pangs of anxiety while en route here to Oregon to meet the new 9-11. I'd seen earlier pictures and I saw how Porsche had streamlined the exterior and plumped up the interior. But what had me concerned was, had the new car lost that good old seat of the pants feel when driving it? Well, after spending 500 miles behind the wheel of the new car, I'm happy to report it has not. And it's also not an expensive Boxster. This is a 911, and it's certainly improved. As for the exterior, well, I hate to say this, Porsche, but I would still take the old body with this beautiful rear end and put it on the new chassis. So there you go. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Well, there's about a thousand dealers here today, and what you see is the free market at work. Uh, this is a very old process. It goes back to Babylonian times. It's a verbal treaty among men, and that's what options really work on. TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.